like I said, I have plenty of questions that I have worked on that I want to deal with. But at the same time, even though I didn't get questions from any other person, I would like to give room for at least three people this morning if you would like to ask any question, if you would like to ask any question. And the guideline is the question will have to deal with Christianity, the Bible, morality, even if it has to deal with politics or whatever, it's okay as long as we apply it to the Bible, okay? In other words, I'm not going to answer any question that is not going to be answered from the Bible, okay? So don't ask me about agriculture or biology or anything like that, okay? So that's that's the... So I'm going to give three, three opportunities uh, for people to ask questions. Now, let me do this. I know two of you have raised your hands already. I want to give opportunity for visitors first. Do we have any visitor here that has a question they would like to ask? Yes, a question has been bothering you. And, uh, and you believe the Bible has the answer? It doesn't mean that I'll be able to answer it. If I'm not able to answer it, I'll work on it, and I will bring the, question, the answer next time. But if I'm able to answer it, we'll answer it and give you references of how you can look them up in the Bible. Okay, any visitor that has a question. Today is our question and answer Sunday, so we feel free to do this. Okay, if we don't have a visitor, I saw Aaron's end first. Okay, what is the difference between soul and spirit? Okay, um, Shalina. Okay. Okay. A minister, a preacher, and a pastor. Make, let's make sure we got it all down. A reverend, a minister, a preacher, and a pastor. Okay, what are the differences? Shemai, I saw your hand up. Okay. Okay, what did you get that? Okay. Okay, it looks like those uh, questions that I can answer fairly quickly. So I'm open it up for more questions. More questions. Yes. Okay. You can tell it comes from a lawyer, politician. Okay. Johnson? Okay. Okay. I, I, let, let me do this. I will make it neutral so I don't deal with the present candidates. I'll just go with how should a Christian choose to vote for a candidate? Yes. Yes. In a man. Woo. Okay. Looking for in a man. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's uh Okay, okay. Good, good, good question. Ah, that one would take a whole message. So I promise you I will dedicate one sermon to that. Okay. (laughs) Sister Hazel Wagner. Wagner. 
what do I think of Joel Osteen's The Hostinification of American Christianity? Okay, all right. Okay, one, one more, one last one, one last one. Anyone, anyone has? Yes, Dan. Before marriage, okay, show Christians having relationships uh, live together before marriage. That's your question, okay. Okay. All right, Francisco, go answer the questions. Wonderful. Great. So, okay, let's uh, start from the beginning. Whatever que- first question we have. Yeah. What is the difference between soul and spirit? Okay, what is the difference between soul and and spirit. This is what I call a theological question uh, in the sense that ultimately speaking we don't know. Okay? But the Bible does talk about what makes a whole person. What makes a whole person is body, soul, and spirit. I think when it comes to body, we are totally very clear on what that means. Even though we really don't deal with it from the Christian point of view all the time. Because we think one body is better than another one. And that is not something we got from the Bible. In fact, that is usually not what we get when we are born until we're brought home and somebody messes us up. Then we decide to think about bodies being different and it goes into uh, beauty, it goes into color, it goes into height, it goes into breadth or width. Uh, on and on and on and on. So we begin to define them in the way that we want, even though you really don't have to have the body in order to be a person. And you don't have to have the body in a particular way in order to be counted a full person. Please, if what I'm saying sounds like German or French to you, just raise your hand, okay, so I can go over it and be clear, okay? Basically, what I'm saying is this. It doesn't matter if you're missing part of your body, you're still a person. The body does not define you, okay? We are body, soul, and spirit. And at one point later on, uh, uh, we are going to exchange that body to another type of body that is different from what we have now. And the reason why we know that is because Jesus already demonstrated that for us. He died and then he rose again and when he rose again the body that he had before was not the body that he had after. Because the body that he had after he could enter a room without opening the doors, which was different from what he had before he died. Okay, so we know from that that God is going to give us a body after this physical world that is not going to be limited by our brain and our physical definition of what body is. 
regardless of how perfect you think your body is, it is not perfect. Amen. But God is going to give you a perfect body. That's not going to age. You won't need no cream <laughs> in heaven. Okay? Uh, you won't have to have different color lipstick. Amen. Well, anyway, let me leave that alone. Okay. So, th- that's the body part. And sometimes we Christians make a mistake in putting more emphasis on the body than we do the soul and the spirit. The soul is that which makes us relate as persons in relation to our creator. Our soul. Our soul is that part of us that makes us who we are as creation of the almighty God. Our spirit is that which makes us relate to our creator. We understand what he wants from us and we understand what we owe him because his spirit that he has given to us is in us and that was makes us to be able to relate to him. And that is why the Bible says that anyone that tells you they're atheist, they're actually lying. Because you cannot have spirit and be an atheist. You know there's a relationship to a God. And number one, if you're going to be an atheist, you have to, de- de- uh, you have to uh, deny the existence of God. And once you deny the existence of God, you're actually proving that God exists. You cannot argue about nothing. Right? You know, you, it, it, let me tell you that on my way here, I saw a pink elephant. Okay. Well, I may be fibbing a little bit, but the point I'm trying to make is this. Immediately I said a pink elephant, all of you had something that you already pictured. Okay. The one thing you cannot deny is there is a color called pink. And there is an animal called elephant. So even if I'm going to deny it, I have to have something in my head or in my mind to deny it. If I'm going to make it up, I have to have something in my head and my mind to make it up. Once you make it up, then that thing exists. You cannot make up something that does not exist. Are you with me? Okay. It's it's your spirit. Your spirit can never deny the existence of God. Your body may, because your body, part of your body is your brain and your mind, and they can do that. Okay. So, yes. I'm afraid of these follow-ups because... Wait a minute, real quick. Until you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, just so that, wait, help me understand, the Holy Spirit, we all have the Holy Spirit in us? No. no. Not we until all, we accept? The Holy Spirit is everywhere. Right. So it's there, but it's not, not brought alive or brought into action until you accept it. He can work on you, he can convince you, he can convict you, but until you become a Christian, he does not indwell you. Right. Okay. All right. Yes, 
so. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, again, like, that's on the spot. So, I will do a better job on it, you know, find someone. Let's go to question number two. What is the difference between a reverend, a minister, a preacher, and pastor? A reverend, a minister, a minister, preacher, preacher, and pastor. And pastor. Okay. Uh, they're basically all, you know, something uh, different shades. A reverend. Okay. Uh, Charlena, a reverend is a title that is given to someone after ordination. That's the way it should be used properly. Now, in many churches, especially a lot of National Baptist churches, they don't reserve it just for people who have been ordained. Sometimes it can be given to someone who has been licensed or someone who has just declared that God has called them to preach, and uh, the church accepts them to preach. So they give them the title reverend. Okay. The idea is that they are to be reverends. Uh, they are to uh, be given the respect that they are somehow commissioned by a holy God to work. And that's why they have the title reverend. Reverend basically means give respect to. You know. uh, so that's, that's why uh, sometimes you will see me, and I'm very particular about that. I will not call a person a reverend unless they have been ordained. That's my policy. There are some churches where if a person declares today that they've been called, they start calling them reverend. Okay, But... Uh, Officially and uh, in most denominations, you cannot be called a reverend until you're ordained. And the policies are different in different denominations. For example, in the American Baptist churches of the West, you don't only have to be uh, licensed by your church to be called a reverend, but you also have to have a master's degree in divinity in order to qualify to be called a reverend. The same thing in the Presbyterian churches. You have to pass the ordination, and you cannot sit for the ordination until you have your master's degree. And you can't have your master's degree until you go to college and get your bachelor's degree. So that, that title, Reverend, uh, it's different from denomination to denomination. Okay, In most National Baptist churches... Those rules don't apply. They can call people reverend anytime. In fact, some National Baptist churches are so bad that they still, they even call a person a doctor who didn't even pass high school. Okay? Uh, so um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a different, you know, uh, most churches are what you call autonomous organizations. That means they are unique in themselves, and they are free to make their own rules and whatever, and uh, they don't uh, answer to anybody except for that local body. Okay, so the minister, a minister would be someone who has accepted the calling to preach. In other words, God has called them to preach. Immediately, they become a minister. God has called them to work. Now, I also have problem with that even though I use it. Many of you have asked me, refer to Minister Hunt, Minister Derek Hunt as Minister Hunt. The only reason why I call her, I mean, I call him minister and not reverend is because he is licensed, but he has not been ordained. Okay? And that's why I will refer to a person as minister. And it's in some churches, they refer to ladies who have been called as ministers, but that's not really proper title because whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. You should have the title reverend, minister, preacher, 
or pastor if you have been called by God and you've gone through the process. It's not defined by your uh, gender, okay? Uh, so that is the minister different. I know you have a question, but let me make one more point before your question. Don't forget your question. Uh, I always say we are all ministers. And what I mean by that is that we have all been called by God to serve him in the world. If you are a Christian, you are a minister. A minister simply is someone who has a gift or a calling, and their gift and their calling meets somebody else's needs. That's how you become a minister. So you can be a Christian and not minister to anybody, then you should never use that title. If you have that title just because you say you've been called by God, but you're not doing anything, that title is not correct either. Okay. Yes, follow-up question. So what you're saying is in your, in your eyes, oh, excuse me. Uh, so you're saying in your eyes an ordained reverend and an ordained minister are the same. Correct. But not an ordained reverend and a minister who has not been ordained, those are two different things. Say that say that last point okay. again. So a ordained reverend uh-huh. and a, a minister that has not been ordained, those are not the same to you. Correct. Okay. They're not. I just want to just try to Yeah. So an ordained minister and an ordained reverend are both the same thing. They're both the same. Okay. Yeah. As some may prefer reverend, and some may prefer minister, and, you know, it's okay, you know. A minister is a minister, okay. And ultimately, it's only God who determines who is, whether you have the title or not, okay. A preacher is someone who preaches the gospel. That's what a preacher is. I think that's perfectly explicit, right? If you call him a preacher, he has to preach. You don't call him a preacher because he said he has been called to preach. That's very important because there are a lot of people who go with the title, I'm a preacher, but they've never preached in their life. How do you know you're a preacher if you've never preached a sermon? You're a preacher because you do what that what preachers do. And preachers preach the gospel. Amen. And preachers who are truly called don't wait for a pulpit in order to preach. And the last one is pastor. In the New Testament, that title pastor. It's not unique in the sense that it shares affinity with another title called elder. And sometimes in the New Testament, you have what they call plurality of elders. So you have plurality of pastors. A pastor is an elder, but in most congregations, in most local churches, the pastor is the lead person that has the responsibility to shepherd that congregation. Okay, so when you say a pastor, somebody cannot be called a pastor unless they have a church. If you introduce me to Dan and you say, this is, Pastor uh, Daniel Lagomasino, and I shook his hand and said, hey, how are you doing? What, what church are you with? Oh, I don't have a church. Why do you call yourself a pastor? Okay. You <laughs> so you, can, you cannot call yourself a pastor unless you have a congregation that you are leading. Now, I did mention plurality of elders and plurality of pastors, even in our congregation, uh, 
you can have that if you give title to people. In other words, this is the pastor in charge of education. This is the pastor in charge of children. This is the pastor in charge of our youth. This is the pastor in charge of whatever. So you can have seven pastors in one church. Okay? And any follow-up? Any clarification? Question? Yes. Do those people in the church, do they have to be ordained, like you said? Uh, to be, to hold title pastor? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Just wanted to be clear. Yeah. I saw another hand. Up. Okay. All right. Okay. So I wanted, I know they said the preacher, the pastor, the minister. What about the prophets? We hear so much about the prophets. Would you like to elaborate on that? Okay. Wow. Okay. Now, let, let me say this. When we talk about prophets, they are usually limited to church of God in Christ or church of God in Indiana. There are two. And, and also, yeah, church of God in Christ or church of God in Indiana. There are two congregations that are very similar. And sometimes you will have Churches that we call charismatic churches. Is there another title for that? Uh, charismatic churches uh, that will call a person a prophet. Uh, some titles we don't even use at all in the Baptist church, okay? Like bishop. There will be a bishop also in the uh, Church of God in Christ congregation. And I'm not sure if there are others. I think Church of God Indiana also has a bishop. Catholics, Catholics have bishop, but they're different. They're not defined the same way. Methodists also have uh, bishops, but they're a little bit different from the Church of God in Christ uh, because they have localities that they're responsible for. So it's, uh, it's a good question. It's... Something strange to a Baptist church or to a uh, uh, I don't think it would be that strange to Church of God in Christ or Church of God because they're used to it. Now, a prophet is usually somebody that is regarded as a pastor who also has revelations to the church. That, that would be the title they would give them. Now, when it comes to a lot of evangelical churches that are not charismatic, we use the title prophet, but it's a little bit different from the way uh, the charismatic churches use them because we believe that you can be a prophet without being a pastor, without being a preacher without being a minister, because the Holy Spirit gave you the gift of prophecy. And you can use that gift of prophecy to edify the local church. And therefore, it's not limited to a man or a woman. So you can have a man prophet, you can have a woman prophetess. So, I hope that answers this a little bit. Yes. Indiana. Indiana. Yeah, that's just a denomination, just clarification of def, a denomination. Like, for example, PICF is Church of God Indiana. And they're different from uh, Cornerstone Community Church of God in Christ. Even though they are Church of God, Church of God in Christ. Okay. It's different. Yeah. It, it, and, and that was used basically to define where the denominational headquarters is, is located. Okay. All right. Any other follow-up? Okay. Let's go to the next question. Question number three. Is T.D. Jakes a false teacher? And what is your opinion about him? Can you clarify? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. 
Okay, so basically, you know, I like T.D. Jakes, and I listen to him often, and so basically my dad was telling me about how he doesn't believe in the Trinity, or it's just like, basically he believes that Jesus, like, basically can't be in more place than one at one time or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so basically I just want to know, like, what do you think about him? And I don't know, because when I hear him, he preaches directly from the Bible, so, you know, yeah. So Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well... Let me let me give you the positives about T.D. Jakes. And then I'll deal with the negatives. Uh, T.D. Jakes, uh, it's, it's a good speaker. And I'm going to refer to another speaker from the question that was had about Joel Austin. Okay. So, uh, and... T.D. Jakes is very solid in some areas of theology. And he is also what I call a social gospel preacher. In that he doesn't just preach, he also does it. So he has ministries that his congregation is doing that is reaching out to the poor and to the needy and to different things like that. So all those are positives. The negative is that, number one, I don't believe in churches that are big mega churches. Because that is not the biblical model. And when you get to that, then you become a corporation instead of being a church. And you can tell when most of these ministers become corporations and business, and they're no longer churches anymore. The other thing that is probably more dangerous in the case of T.D. Jakes, you've mentioned it, his view of the Trinity is very atrocious. Not only does he not believe in the three persons of the Trinity, he has a belief that is more closely aligned with Jehovah Witnesses in the way he defines the Trinity. Now, he has been on several TV programs where this is not, I mean, you can Google him and do this and you will see it, where he tried to defend himself and say he's no longer believing in that, that he has changed. But a lot of times when you listen to his message, you can tell from the message that he still believes in that, what I call Sabellianism, where you have God appearing in Jesus And when he's appearing in Jesus, then the Trinity is not full because it's Jesus. And then he can appear the Holy Spirit and the Trinity is not full because it is the Holy Spirit. Or it can appear as the Father and the Trinity is not full but is the Father. And uh, sometimes he refers to God the Father as if he was the physical father as I am the father of Shola. Okay? When the, Bi- when the Bible says God the father, that's not what it's talking about. It's not a physical birth relationship. And sometimes uh, he, he preaches in that mode. Um, so I, I don't know um, my Advice to you is that uh, you need to be solid in what you believe. And there's nothing wrong in listening to someone that's uh, teaching and it's trying to make you a better person. Okay? And they don't have to be Christians for you to listen to them. Uh, there could be non-Christians who are teaching the right thing. Maybe they're teaching you how to manage your money. Okay, you don't have to be a Christian to teach a person that. 
But if you're trying to teach the Bible, it's very important for us to be all to be very solid in our knowledge of the Bible because there are a lot of false teachers out there. And believe me, they sound good. And especially if you're listening to them more than you're listening to the good ones. And then you get yourself all messed up and you don't know the difference. That's, that's, that's my only caution on that. Okay. So, um, basically, I don't know. So, like, you know, when I hear his message, I feel like the spirit moving. So, basically, I mean. Okay. Well, what do you mean by the spirit moving? What do I mean by that? Yes. Um, it makes you feel good. doesn't mean the spirit is no, moving. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. No, like, um, I don't know how to explain it. Like, you know, when you hear the word and you just feel the spirit fill you up and you just, you know, feel. Yeah. I mean, feel good. Yeah. But, you know what I mean? Okay, like really it, that's, that's exactly my caution to you, okay. okay? Sometimes you may leave here and don't feel good. <laughs> no, that doesn't saying, mean the Holy Spirit wasn't here. <laughs> right, right. No, but I'm saying okay. I feel like... It means the Holy directly. Spirit was spanking you, but you didn't like it. I mean, that's necessary okay. sometimes. So, so the thing is, don't base, don't base your evaluation of a preacher on how good they make you feel. Yeah. No, I'm saying, but I feel like he preaches directly from the Bible, and so that's what I'm saying. But I've, I've the never Jehovah heard... Witnesses teach from the Bible. But don't they have like a different? The Bible? Mormons teach from the Bible. Okay. Okay. Joel Osteen preaches from the Bible. Okay, so, and then one other question. Do you have any preachers that you recommend that you feel are, you know? Yeah, because that's the only person that I know. So that's basically the only person that I listen to during the week because I don't, yeah. So I'm saying, do you have any recommendations for me? The Holy Spirit. (laughs) Read your Bible more. And study your Bible more. Okay. Yes. You said the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons preach from the Bible, but it's not the same Bible that we read. Well, with, as far as the, as the Mormons are concerned, it's the same Bible except they have another book. Okay? Uh, the, the Jehovah Witnesses is the same Bible except they have their own translation. Well, that's called translation. You have to understand this. The Bible was not written in English. That's why I had to study Greek and Hebrew. The Bible was, okay, in in order for you to have an English Bible, you have to translate it. So, the Jehovah Witnesses, by the way, there are more than a thousand translations available. The New World Translation, which is the Jehovah Witnesses translation, is just one of them. Now, it is atrocious, the translation, but it is still a translation. Am I confusing you? Well, I just don't understand how um, you can translate that s- so far off the base. Didn't they say that Jesus was the angel Michael? That's something like that. That's their doctrine. That's different from their translation. I see. And because you, if you look in the Bible, you will not be able to prove that. But it's in their theology. I see. In their doctrine or teaching. Now, Please, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go out and get the New World Translation because it's a terrible translation, okay? But I'm still saying it is a translation from the Greek and Hebrew to English. But it is done wrong because they base it on their doctrine. So they're translating from what they have already predetermined. And that is why they will say in John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, 
And the word was with God, and the word was a God. Okay? And all they've added to it that's different from us is A, an indefinite article, and Greek don't have indefinite articles. So how, how will you supply it? It's through your own interpretation. And then when they say God, they will use small g instead of capital G. That is based on their own ideas. But they're still translating. If you put your Bible NIV or King James or New King James beside their Bible, you will see it has the same chapters and the same verses. They're just done differently. Okay, thank you. Any other follow-up on that? Okay, what's the next one? Okay. Oh. How should Christian choose to vote? Okay. Thank you. That's a tough question. Because... Uh, This is the principle I think we all should use. And that principle is this. When you're choosing the president of a country, you have to evaluate that person based on that country's constitution. Don't evaluate them based on the Bible. Evaluate them based on the constitution of that country. Now, when it comes to issues that are dear to you, you should judge those issues based on the Bible. So if you want to find out where does this candidate stand when it comes to how you treat the poor, Don't base it on your culture and don't base it on your constitution. Base it on what the Bible says. If you want to know what the candidate has to say about abortion, don't base it on your culture and don't base it on your constitution. You base it on the Bible. Where the Bible doesn't talk about the issue then you have to base it on your moral values or what I would call Christian ethics because a lot of time Christian ethics don't necessarily come from the Bible. They just come from the general culture. and uh, That's the one thing that I will say it's really important when you're choosing a candidate. Okay? Whether it be racial relations, whether it be economics, whether it be uh, foreign policy, whatever, uh, you need to guide it by what your constitution says. And when the constitution says something, then it's also important to guide it by what the Bible says. You remember what the early Christians said? Remember that most of the Bible even tells, they tell us to obey the government that is set before us. And when they're talking about that, they're not talking about Christian governments. So, when Jesus was asked to pay taxes, well, when, when Jesus was asked to pay taxes, he didn't say, I'm God. I'm not going to pay no tax. So he was under the Roman rule and laws. So he told his disciples, go catch the fish and take the money out of the mouth and pay it for me. Okay? And when they asked him, should we honor Caesar or should we, honor, should we pay taxes to Caesar? He said, let me see the money you use. And when they gave it to him, he said, whose image is on it? Is Caesar? Then you pay to Caesar what belongs to him. 
So when you hear a candidate say, I'm not paying taxes because I'm smart. <laughs> you call that lawlessness, right? So it, it's really important. Again, this is what I'm saying, that you have to guide, judge everything. Look at what the Constitution says. The person obeying the Constitution, and if they're obeying the Constitution, then uh, they are not necessarily probably going to obey what you think is right. For example, let's take the issue of uh, men marrying men and women marrying women. If it is just by the Bible, what is the answer? No. Uh, I can't hear you. No. Okay, it's very clear. There's no debate. But when it comes to the Constitution, because this country is not based on the Bible. A lot of people have these wrong ideas that this country was based on the Bible. No, it wasn't. Yes. I want to know, to, because for me, it's, um, it's to vote between heinous number one and heinous number two. Heinous sneaky or heinous out there in your face. And um, morally, I don't want to vote. I mean, I might go for the three or four candidate uh, because I don't know, I guess because I don't know their sin or how bad it is yet. Mm -hmm. But I do know that both the top two have, have been lawless okay. in maybe super egregious ways. And so do I have a moral, you know, what does God say to do in that regard? If you know one person's, I don't know. Well, if you don't want to vote, uh, you're giving up your Christian responsibility. Amen. Okay, because number one, you need to recognize that we're not just voting for presidents. Okay? The election is it's about a lot of things. And the presidents just happen to be one of them. If, you, if you're in Sonoma, your ballot is probably going to contain at least 20, 30 things that you're trying to decide. Okay, so if you stay home, you're not being a good Christian. That's number one. Number two, you have to recognize also that you not choose. There's never been a perfect president in American history. Amen. Now, some that are on your money right now, if you know their history, you tear up your money. Okay, so uh, it'll be wrong to say. Um, because this person doesn't meet this standard, then I'm not going to vote for anyone. Okay? You just have to decide. You can leave it blank. Or you can write your name in there. Okay? Uh, Aaron for president. <laughs> okay? But, you know, you just have, I, I believe, personally, it's, it's a must for a Christian. We you can, should vote. We can put Jesus Christ you on should, the ballot. You should try to make... Yeah, that's still, that's say that if It's not going to be the third or the fourth. So to not vote, even though they're both horrible right now, to not vote for one of them is basically a non-vote. Well, but it is your right. It's your right. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, if you're going to vote for the Green Party, yes. the Green Party's not going to win. Okay, so basically... The Green Party may win this time. Mm -hmm. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. Well, no, no, no. I'm, I'm not being funny. Right. But I'm saying that I really believe that we as Christians should accept the will of the person who is voting. So if that person says, I'm not going to vote for either of these two, but I'm going to vote for my Senate, I'm going to vote for my Congress, I'm going to vote for my street, I'm going to vote for all my propositions, they've carried on their Christian responsibility. Right. 
Right. Okay. No, I so, was... but I understand your argument. Okay. I understand your argument and your point that a non-vote is actually a vote. a vote. Yes, it is. So, if you don't vote and the person wins, it's because you did not because, vote. Because you did not vote. Okay. And so, that's, that's I said. But again, that person have to live with that. So for the next four years, you have to, if you didn't vote, you have to know that you put that person who was in the office, you put them in there because you did not vote. Yes. The thing is about voting, there is, especially in the U.S., there's been so many times that there were people not allowed to vote. Yes. I mean, just, propos just, just the, the, the Constitution 19. Women couldn't vote yes. until that was... Blacks couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. My mother would roll over in her grave if she knew that we weren't voting. You need to vote because mm -hmm. otherwise you got no complaints after that. Correct. At all. You need to go out and yeah. vote no matter what you think is on the ballot. Yeah. Because too many I'm... people have died to get the right to vote. Correct. And, and again, you know... Um, I, I'm not just looking at it from the social point, which you are looking at it from. I'm looking at it from a religious and biblical point, is that, you know, in the New Testament, there was never a Christian government in the New Testament. None. But Christians had to live in that culture, and they had to carry out their Christian responsibilities. And the disciples and the apostles told them they're supposed to do it. In the Old Testament, I don't care what the Jews tell you, but they have always been under somebody else's rule. They were really not free until 1949. But they have always participated and some of them have been carried into captivity and in captivity they also serve foreign leaders and they served in their cabinets. Even though they knew they were Baal worshippers and different things but they, they did not give up their own beliefs. They did not give up their allegiance to their God even though they were double faced and God you know, talk to them about that all the time. Okay? But it's really important for you. It is your Christian responsibility to vote and help direct where the country is going. If your vote doesn't come out positive the way you want it, it's not your fault. But if you didn't vote and we go where we're not supposed to go, then it's your fault. Amen, Amen Dan? All right. Two more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this question is, I'm going to refer, what, um, what should Christian men and women, what essential things, I'm sure, Sorry, should Christian men and women look for? So, because it was um, what the essential correct, things should they correct. look for? Correct, correct. Christian, I believe she's talking about single, right? Single yes, yes. Christian women and men. Okay. Yeah, uh, and uh, to be frank with you, I have to say that I cannot do justice to that question today, but I'm going to uh, work on it and do a better job giving you uh, a presentation on that. But let me make comments. Okay. First is, if you are born again by the Spirit of God, and you call yourself a Christian, because that's what a Christian is. A Christian is not someone who comes to church. A Christian is somebody who has given their life to Christ. The book of Romans chapter 10, 
says, you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Okay. If you have accepted him as Lord and Savior, then you have to live your life based on what the Bible says. And the Bible says that your first priority is to make sure you are dating or marrying another Christian. That's priority number one. You, can, you cannot say, I'm going to date this person so I can win them to Christ. And I've seen some people do that, but what ends up happening is they win them to the devil and they leave the church because they are so in love with this person, okay? And uh, it, it ends up in really, really, really bad. The Bible says darkness has nothing to do with light. Amen. Amen. If you go into a dark room and you turn on the light, what happens to darkness? He runs away. The Bible says you are light. Those who are not Christians are darkness. And they don't mix. So that's the first thing that you got to uh, do. The other thing that you need to look for If you're a woman, and I'm very serious about this, if you're a woman and you're interested in a man, if they don't have a job, don't date them. Yes. You're... <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, let, let, me, let me deal with that because that's a good point. <laughs> it's a good point. Now, but do you know why you retired? Because you had a job. Okay. <laughs> The same way I say this, some people say, well, today's Sabbath, I need to have rest. If you didn't work, you don't need a Sabbath. Because God worked six days, then he rested. Okay, if you don't work, you don't have a Sabbath. And if you haven't worked, you don't have a retirement. Okay, so it's really important that you do that. The other thing you need to look for in a man you're interested in is sneak and check their keychains. Okay? Car, make sure that they have at least three keys on their keychains. All right. He's telling you he has one. And he's available. <laughs> so what I, what I tell people is, if you're dating somebody, you need to know they have a key to a house or an apartment. Not, okay, not their mama's house or their papa's house. Their own house. And make sure they have a key to a car. And make sure they have a key that has something to do with their job. Amen? If they don't have one, uh, postpone the dating. 
Amen. Amen. Just because they go to church doesn't mean they're going to be able to feed you. <laughs> now, it's funny, but uh, one of the major causes for divorce, Amen. single parenthood, is because you get hooked up with somebody because you think they're lanky and good looking and, and they go to 24 hours, not listen. And they're working out and they have all these muscles busting out of their body. And they're useless. They're useless. They can't even feel. And then you make a mistake sleeping with them and having a child. You have a child for a useless man. What do you think they're going to do? They're not going to feed you that child they brought into the world. And they don't even care where that child lives. I see many men fighting women that bought children for them. And they don't even give them enough money to pay for where that mother is living and that child is living in. It's ridiculous. Make sure they look good, too. All right. <laughs> well, yes. I was going to say, Roy Morgan did an excellent job marketing himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one last thing. I'm going to say this, uh, and then I'll move to the last question. Um, and I'm sorry we took too much time today. But... The other thing that I really believe, if you are a Christian, remember I'm talking to Christians. Some of this you can apply to, you know, other areas of life. But if you're a Christian and you're interested in a man, a young man, uh, and they don't go to your church, it's really important for you to visit their church one two or three times, and it should be a surprise visit. (laughs) You should not tell them, I'm coming to visit your church. Uh Just show up. (laughs) Because there are a lot of men, when they know you go to church, they make up a name of a church they go to. I go to Satan's Baptist Church. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and because they know you'll never come, just go there and visit and ask for him. And then if he wasn't there, write him an email. Don't go visit him. He doesn't deserve that. Amen. Write him an email. Say, I came to your church. You were not there. What happened? Okay, and you know the only excuse that can count, that can work, is I was sick, or the dog ate my leg. (laughs) Last question. Should Christians live together before marriage? The answer is no. And, And I said no, not because the Bible says that. is because of Christian ethics. Are we all together? Okay, there's no place in the Bible that you're going to find it saying you should not live with somebody you're not married to. But it is very clear that when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, one of the lines of the prayer is, Lead us not into temptation. That means give me enough brains to know what temptation is so I can run away from it. The reason why a lot of people get pregnant before they get married is because they don't know the difference between temptation and situation.
every time you don't have principles to guide relationship, you're going to get in trouble. When you're dating someone, they earn the right to even hold your hand. If you're dating somebody, the first day they want to hold your hand, that tells me they have no principle at all. You need to earn that. And I cannot even see how a Christian could think it's okay for me to shack up with somebody that I'm not married to. Now, there are cases in, you know, uh, college where you share an apartment or whatever with someone that's also controlled by the school and uh, different things uh, that, you know, allowed people to live in the same area. Not in the same room, but in the same area that's not, you know, that's still in the same apartment area. That's, uh, you know, boy and girl and whatever, male and female. Um, Even with that, I'll be very careful that I'm making sure that I am not uh, visiting somebody uh, that's going to provide temptation for me. You can say you're strong, but you're not that strong. Because I know you're a sinner. Is there anyone in here that's not a sinner? Then don't stay with somebody you're not married to. It's a temptation you don't need in your life. That's how a lot of pastors get in trouble. Because they get to a point where they think they're too holy. And they can't do wrong. We are all sinners. And so you need to do things that are going to protect you from that area. Amen? Amen. So some of you probably going to get mad at me, but I have nobody in mind when I'm speaking. I'm just speaking. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, how did we... Oh, okay. Well, Joel Osteen has a different issue in that he has the same thing in that he's a good speaker. Uh, But Joel Osteen is the worst preacher I've ever heard (laughs) when it comes to the gospel. If he mentions sin, he mentions it just like a bypass, a byword. There's a book that is out by a man named Hank Hanegraaff. He's called The Bible Answer Man. And the title of the book is The Ossinification of American Christianity. Ostinification of American Christianity. The Christianity that Joel Osteen preaches is not Christianity at all. Well, with D.D. Jakes, he has problem with some doctrines. With Joel Osteen, he has problem with everything. He just happens to be a very successful speaker. Could have been doing one of those real estate uh, middle of the night programs and he'll be just as successful. Infomercial, yeah. Did I see somebody saying? Yes. Joyce Myers is a woman form of 
word of faith Christianity. And it's going to take a lot to go into that. Okay. Um, yeah, Jehovah Witnesses use scripture a lot too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, what happens is there are some really, really, really good preachers on TV and on radio. There are a lot of good preachers that have good ministry. And uh, maybe next week I'll give you names of those preachers. You know, you can follow them on radio, on TV, or whatever. But there are a lot of bad ones out there, too. And some of the bad ones are the most popular because today our itching ears are very, very active. A lot of people don't want to hear what I have to say. They just want to run home and turn Joel Osteen on. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um... I did this this way because uh, the preparation I made was uh, not going to be as effective because the person that wanted to hear is not here. You know, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs>